these are the compositions that we are applying to trees in the first place. Okay. So I want to consider a very simple problem. Let's say that my input is a tree. So I have a tree T. It has a set of vertices. It has a set of edges. And of course, the number of edges is just the number of vertices minus one because it's a tree. Okay. And then you read this tree, you can pre process it a little bit. And after that, I will give you a bunch of queries. And every query is just going to ask for the distance between two nodes. So I'm going to give you U and V. This is not the homework, I promise. I'm going to give you U and V in every query. And you have to output the distance from U to V. Now, we already know how to solve this problem because we already know that if I want to find the distance from u to v, well, this is a tree. So there's going to be a unique path from u to v. So I can take my vertex u and let's say my vertex v. And I know that there is a unique path that goes from u to v. And I also know what the highest point in that path is going to be. That's going to be the lowest common ancestor of u and v, right? So this is the lowest common ancestor of u and v. And we already know how to find lowest common ancestors. So now the distance from u to v would just be the distance from u to its lowest common ancestor, plus the distance from this lowest common ancestor to v. But these, dis these distances are super easy to compute because you can just keep track of the depth of every vertex and then the distance is just the difference in depth, right? So we already have algorithms to answer this and we've seen that uh, we can do this basically, uh, we can handle each query in log n time by finding the lowest common ancestor. By the way, the algorithms that we've seen for lowest common ancestor are not optimal. There are algorithms that would actually do the pre-processing in linear time for lowest common ancestor, and then they would answer each query in amortized constant time. But we're not going to get into that. I'm just going to make the problem a little bit harder. And I'm going to say my edges have weights now. In the input, I'm going to have a tree. And then I'm going to have a weight function, which basically assigns a weight, a real number, to each one of the edges. So now when I want to find the distance from u to v, it's basically the sum of the weights of all the edges that are on the path from u to v. As soon as I do this, you cannot use the LCA technique anymore, right? Because sure, I know that the path from U to V has to go through this LCA. Let's give it a name. Let's say this is L. So I know that the path from U to V has to go through L. Fine. But this just tells me that the distance from U to V is equal to the distance from U to L plus the distance from L to V. But how do I find those distances? How do I know what is the distance from U to L? Okay. So previously, when I didn't have weights, this would just be the difference in depths. But now I have weights. What can I do? Well, maybe I can pre-compute the distances from every vertex to all of its ancestors. OK? That's not too hard to do. I can say for every vertex, what is the distance from this vertex to every single one of its ancestors? But now I have a problem. And the problem is that I might have many ancestors. So actually my worst case would be if my tree is just a path like this. So let's say this is my root and I just have a path like this. And if I'm computing or pre-computing the distances from every vertex to every one of its ancestors, then I'm already spending n squared time just to pre-compute. OK, so ideally, I would like to have a tree that is not too deep. I want the height of my tree to be small. Now, 
Actually, here you can see that we can also, again, use the techniques that we've seen uh, in the lecture on LCA. So instead of keeping track of the distances from every vertex to all of its ancestors, I can only consider the ancestors that are a power of two steps above. And then I can create algorithms that are very similar to the algorithms we had for LCA. So it's possible to solve this problem using the techniques in the LCA lecture, but I'm going to give you a different kind of solution. And the solution that I want to talk about is based on the concept of centroids. Okay, so let's say I have a tree. So I have this tree T and let's say that it has N vertices. What is a centroid? A centroid is a node like this node four here, such that if I remove it, all of the remaining connected components are kind of small. That's the intuition. Okay, so if I take each one of my vertices and I remove it, of course, I will get a bunch of connected components, except for the case where the vertex I'm removing is a leaf, in which case I will have only one connected component. But then I want to find the vertex and remove such that all the remaining connected components are small. And by small, I mean that they have at most half of the vertices of the original tree. Okay. So in a tree T with N vertices, a centroid is a vertex, let's call it V, such that if I take the tree T and I remove this vertex from it, in this resulting graph, any connected components that I look at has at most N over two vertices, such that T minus V has connected components of size less than or equal to N over two. Okay. So I have 15 vertices here. I want to remove a vertex. I can, for example, remove vertex four. And if I remove this vertex four, what happens in the rest of the graph? I will have this connected component, which has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven vertices. I will have this one, which has only two vertices. And I will have this one, which has five vertices. Right. So every remaining connected component has less than half of the vertices of the original graph. Half of the vertices of the original graph would be seven and a half. Okay. So in this case, I would say that this vertex four is a centroid. Now, why are centroids important? Well, because they allow us to do divide and conquer in an easy way. So suppose that I want to do a divide and conquer algorithm, just consider something like merge sort, right? Ideally, I wanted to take my array and break it down into arrays that are much smaller. I wanted to have each one of my subarrays be half of the size of the original array. I'm doing something similar here. I'm saying I want to remove some vertex and I want to make sure that all the parts of the remaining graph are really small. Now I cannot guarantee that I will have only two parts. Maybe I'll have more than two parts, that's fine. But I just want all of the parts to be small. Okay. Now the question is, does a tree always have a centroid? And if it does, how do I actually find it? Well, the answer is yes. There's always at least one centroid. The centroid is not necessarily unique, so I might have several centroids. But there is at least one. And I'm going to give you an algorithm that will find one. And the algorithm is the proof that there is always a centroid. OK, so it's a proof by algorithm. I want to show that every tree has a centroid. The way I show this is that I give you an algorithm that outputs the centroid and I prove that that algorithm is correct. So the tree always has a centroid. Okay, how can I do this? Well, let's find subtree sizes for all of the vertices. So for every vertex, 
I'm just going to remember how many descendants it has, how many children, grandchildren, and so on. So for all the leaves, they just have one descendant, right? One, one, one. And then every vertex's number would be the numbers written at its children plus one. Okay, so the size of the subtree rooted at this vertex. In this case, this is four, this is five, this is one, this is two, five and two, seven. So this is eight. This one is two, two, this is five, this is one. And uh, so I have five and one, six and eight, that's 14. And with this one, it's 15. Okay, so I have the sub result. Now, what do I know about a node that is a centroid? What is, uh, so let's say I use this uh, sub tree size, let's call it just S. What do I know about a vertex V that is a centroid? When I remove V, I have to make sure that all of the connected components have less than half of the vertices. So let's say, for example, when I remove this vertex four, what are the sizes of the resulting connected components? I'm going to have one connected component rooted at each one of its children, right? And for those, I already know the size of the connected components. So the sizes of connected components after removing vertex V, assuming that V had a bunch of children, assuming that I had this vertex V and then I had a bunch of children, Let's call this children U1, U2 to UK. What are the sizes of the connected components that I get after removing V? Well, as at each one of these children, I'm going to have a subtree rooted there. So I will have a connected component of size S of U1. Remember, this was the subtree size of U1. I'm going to have another connected component of size S of U2 and so on to S of UK, right? But there is also one other connected component and that's the connected component that includes the parent of the parent one. So if I'm removing four, I have these things that are below four, but I also have the things that are above four, right? But what is the size of this connected component? It's basically all the vertices that we're not in the subtree of the vertex that I removed. So it's just n minus s of v. Okay. So v is a centroid if and only if all of these numbers are less than or equal to n over 2. Okay. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say, let's start at the top and let's first check, can I remove the root? I've chosen the root arbitrarily, but maybe the root is already a centroid, right? When can I remove the root? Well, for the root, this part is just zero. So I can remove it if the subtrees of all of its children are small. And again, whenever I say small, I mean, uh, having less than n over two vertices or less than or equal to n over two vertices. Okay. So in this case, I start at the root and I see that my root is not a centroid. So what does this mean? This means that the root has a child whose subtree has more than half of all the vertices. Okay. So now I claim that I have to find my centroid in the subtree of that child. Why is that? Because here I have one as the root. And if you look at two and three, they have really small subtrees. So, but four already has more than half of all the vertices in its subtree. So if I remove anything in the subtree of two or the subtree of three, in any case, four and all of its descendants are going to be on one side, and that's not going to give me a centroid. Right? So my centroid has to be in my heaviest child, in some sense, in the child that has 
the most number of points. So I go to that child. In this case, I go to four. And again, I check. Is this a centroid? In order to check that it's a centroid, I just have to check that all of these sub tree sizes uh, are small. So I just look at the sub tree sizes of its children and I look at n minus the sub tree size of this vertex itself. And in this case, I realize that four is a centroid. But what would happen if four was not a centroid? Again, I could make the same argument that I made at the root. I could say that there is a child of four that has more than half of all the vertices in its subtree. So I have to go to that child. And I keep doing this. I cannot do this forever. At some point, uh, the number of uh, children, the number of vertices in the subtree of the heaviest child is going to become less than half of all the vertices. And the first time that that happens, I found a centroid. OK? Now, and I'm sure this happens because if I keep going down, I will eventually get to a leaf. And of course, I, I will find something before I get to a leaf, right? So this simple algorithm, which is actually linear time, always finds a centroid, which also proves that every tree has a centroid. Okay, so we can find a centroid in ON. And again, this ON is not just about starting at the top and walking down until I find my centroid. It's also for computing these subset sizes, sorry, subtree sizes. So these values, they also take ON. OK, now I want to use these uh, ideas that I have here, the idea of centroid. And I want to use it to basically turn this tree into a completely different tree, but on the same set of vertices. OK, so I want to keep all of my vertices, but I want to change my edges. And I want to do it in a way that kind of balances the tree. I want to make sure that I get a tree that has logarithmic height. OK, so this is the idea of what we call centroid decomposition. OK. So here on the left, I have a tree. This is basically the same tree. And I have found a centroid in it. I have found the vertex 4. Now I'm going to remove the vertex four, and in each of the connected components, I'm going to find the centroid. Okay, so these are the ones that are shown in green here. And then I'm going to remove these green centroids. I will have more connected components. And again, in each one of these connected components, I'm going to find the centroid. And I'm going to continue this until all of my connected components become trivial and they have only one vertex in them. And then, of course, when I have one vertex, that one vertex is a centroid. OK. Now, I'm going to create a new tree. And the tree that I create is like this. So I take my very first centroid and I put it as the root of this tree. And then I take all the centroids that were obtained in the next level and I make them children of the root. And I just continue like this. So for example, here, I have four as my first centroid. Four becomes the root here in this new tree. Then in every connected component, I went and found the centroid. So I found two, seven, and 12. They become children of four. Now, in the connected component for which two was centroid, after I remove two, I have three more connected components. And in each one of those, I'm finding a centroid. I'm finding one, five, and six. So one, five, and six become children of two, and so on. So I hope you can convince yourself that this is correct. So basically, it's just going to contain all of the vertices of my original graph, because I'm continuing this for as many steps as it takes until my graph becomes empty, until I remove everything, right? So my set of vertices is going to be the same, but generally speaking, a vertex is closer to the root if it was chosen as a centroid earlier in this process. Okay. 
So this tree, this second tree is called a centroid decomposition of the original tree. So if this is T and this one is uh, C, let's say, we say that C is a centroid decomposition of T. C is a centroid decomposition of T. Okay. Now I wanna prove some properties of centroid decompositions and I'm going to come back and use these properties later. The first property is the intuition that I had from the very beginning. I told you that I want the height of this tree to be small. I want to have logarithmic height, okay? So this is my first lemma. I want to say that the height of the centroid decomposition C is in O of log N. This is actually pretty easy to see. Just see what's happening to my connected components every time that I'm adding a new level in my centroid decomposition. So at first, I'm finding a centroid, I'm finding four, I'm putting it as the root. And I'm removing four. But by definition of a centroid, this means that all the resulting connected components have at most half the size of the original graph, of the original tree, right? But then in each of these connected components, I'm doing the same thing. When I'm choosing two, which is a centroid of this component and removing it, this component is breaking down into parts that are each at most half the size of the original component. So basically, as I'm going down this tree, the size of my connected components is divided by half every time at every level of this tree. I can divide it by half at most log n times, right? Because my original uh, tree, which was just one connected component, had n vertices. So the height of this uh, centroid decomposition can be O log n at most. Okay. But this also gives me another nice notion. If I look at each one of these vertices in my centroid decomposition, it corresponds to some subtree of the original tree. So I say that four corresponds to the whole tree. I say that two corresponds to this connected component in which two was the centroid. So seven corresponds to these two vertices, seven and 11. 12 corresponds to these vertices. So when I took this vertex as the centroid, which other vertices were in the same connected component? I say that those vertices are the connected component or the subtree corresponding to this vertex. And all of them are going to appear as children and descendants of this vertex in my centroid decomposition, right? So for example, four was my first centroid and all of the vertices here are descendants of four. Now two was my centroid in this part, one, three, two, five, six, nine, ten, 10. And you see that these are exactly the vertices that are appearing as descendants of two in the centroid decomposition, okay. Nice. So we proved that the height of our centroid decomposition is at most O log n. But how does this help me with my queries on my original tree? Because remember, I wanted to answer distance queries. And of course, I'm creating this centroid without any regard for the weights of the edges. And the edges in my original tree had some weights but the edges in my centroid are not even the same as the edges in my original tree. So I can't really just assign weights to edges in my centroid. Okay. So suppose that someone, for example, asks me, what is the distance from 11 to 12? How can I find that? I might have some weights here. Maybe I have five, two, one, one. And the distance from 11 to 12 is nine but that's in the original tree. And I want to use my centroid to answer this query about the original tree. Now, I'm going to use the same idea as before. Consider the path from 11 to 12 in my original tree. I said before that this path has to go through the lowest common ancestor, but this was the lowest common ancestor in the original tree. Now, 
the question I want to ask is what happens if I look at the lowest common ancestor, not in the original tree, but in this centroid decomposition? Okay. So for example, I have 11 here, I have 12 here. Their lowest common ancestor is four. And magically, the path from 11 to 12 in the original tree is also going through four. Or let's take two other vertices. Let's take, for example, eight and 15. Their lowest common ancestor in the centroid decomposition is 12. Now, let's look at the path from eight to 15 in the centroid, in the original graph. And it also goes through this 12. So it seems like if I want to go from vertex U to V in the original graph, I have to pass through the lowest common ancestor of U and V in the centroid decomposition. Okay, so this is my second lemma. This is my second lemma. I say for every two vertices U and V, okay, let L be the LCA of U and V, but this is the LCA in the centroid decomposition, not the LCA in the original tree. Then the path from U to V, and this is the path in the original tree in T, has to go through L. I want to prove this. Now, this is actually also very intuitive. Again, look at the root of my centroid decomposition, the vertex four. That's my very first centroid. What happens when I remove four from my original tree? So when I'm removing four, I'm going to get a bunch of different connected components. Right, And each of these different connected components corresponds to one of the subtrees of the children of four in my centroid decomposition. Okay, So these are precisely the connected components that I get in my original graph when I remove four. If you only look at the vertices, forget about the edges. Okay. So if I have two vertices, for example, let's say, six and 12. And these are in the subtrees of two different children of four in C. What does this mean? This means that when I removed four as the centroid, it disconnected six from 12 because six and 12 ended up in two different connected components, right? So you can see it here as well. When I remove four, six is here in this connected component, 12 is in this connected component. So this means that, of course, the path from 6 to 12 had to go through 4 because they were originally connected. But when I removed 4, they're no longer connected. OK? So this already shows you that if I only look at the root, then any path that goes from any vertex in one of its uh, children's subtrees to any other vertex in some other child's subtree has to go through the root. But I can just repeat the same argument, right? So I just remove the root, and now I have uh, smaller connected components. And in each one of these, I'm finding a centroid, and it's the root of uh, the centroid decomposition for this component. And I can just do the same thing. So this proves that for every two vertices u and v, the path from U to V in the original tree T has to go through their lowest common ancestor in the centroid decomposition C. Okay. Now, again, why does this help us answer distance queries? Remember when I talked here about pre-computing the distances from every vertex to its ancestor, my problem was that the height of my tree might be too big. And I said that in the worst case, I would have to pre-compute n squared values, right? But this doesn't happen here. 
because I know that the height of my centroid decomposition is logarithmic. It's in O of log n. So in my pre-processing, I can just compute the distances from every vertex in the centroid decomposition to any one of its ancestors. But when I talk about distance, I'm talking of distance in the original tree. When I'm talking about ancestor, I'm talking of ancestor in the centroid decomposition. So what do I mean here? For example, I look at the vertex three. Who are the ancestors of three in the centroid decomposition? There are one, two, and four, okay? I want to pre-compute the distance from three to one, but this is the distance in T, in the original tree. I want to pre-compute the distance from three to two, and I want to also pre-compute the distance from three to four, but these are all distances in the original tree. I want to pre-compute all of these values. Okay, great. So how do you pre-compute this? How do you find these values? Before getting into that, let's say that I magically have all of these values pre-computed. How do I actually answer distance queries? That part is kind of easier, right? So if someone asks me, what is the distance in T from vertex U to vertex V? I just say I can find their lowest common ancestor in C and then I can say, if that lowest common ancestor was L, this is the distance from U to L in T, plus the distance from V to L or L to V, it doesn't matter, they're both the same, also in T. But L is an ancestor of both U and V in C, that it's literally the lowest common ancestor, right? So I already have both of these things pre-computed, so I can just add them, and answer the query and say, this is the distance from U to B. Okay. So how much time would my query take? I have to basically find this lowest common ancestor. And after I find the lowest common ancestor, this is just O1. It's just adding to, right? So we've seen before that we can find lowest common ancestor in O log n. But here, actually, we can do better than that because the height of my tree is at most log n itself. So actually, the runtime for my lowest common ancestor queries was O log of the height, if you remember that from the lowest common ancestor uh, lecture. So my query time here is actually O log log n. So log of log of n. And that's just the time that I need to find this vertex L. After I find L, I have already pre-computed these two distances. It's just one sum. Okay, so I'm answering each query in O log log N, which is already better than what, what I had with LCA, even for unweighted trees. Okay, but how do I do the pre-computation? I wanna make sure that for every vertex in C, I know its distance to all of its ancestors. But I can look at this from the other side. I can say, this is equivalent to saying that for every vertex in C, I want to know its distance to all of its descendants. Okay. Now, here's the thing. This T is a tree. So suppose that I look at the vertex 4. 4 is going to be the root of my centroid decomposition. So I need the distance from 4 to every other vertex. How do I find the distance from 4 to every other vertex? I can just do a BFS. I don't even need to use Dijkstra or anything like that, even though my edges are weighted, because there is a unique path between every pair of vertices. I can find distances with BFS or even with DFS. OK, so I just do a DFS from 4 and I find the distance from four to all of the other vertices. That's going to cost me how much? It's going to cost me on. Now I do the same thing here. Whenever I find a centroid, let's say I found this centroid two, I just do a DFS from two, but I keep it inside the connected component for which two was the centroid. So I just do a DFS in this connected component 
And I find and remember the distances from two to every other vertex here, which are all the descendants of two in the centroid decomposition. And so on. So basically, whenever I find a centroid, I also do a DFS from that centroid. But I keep the DFS inside the connected component of that centroid. OK. What's the runtime? Yeah. So basically, you can look at it like this. At every level of my centroid decomposition, all of the DFSs corresponding to the vertices in this level are going to touch each vertex of the graph at most once. So every level overall has a cost of ON. And I have at most log N levels, so it's ON log N. Great. So this was much simpler than you thought. It's just do DFS, remember the distances, from the centroids to all the other nodes, and then do lowest common ancestor. And I mean, if you're lazy and you don't want to implement the lowest common ancestor, the height of this tree is log n. You can literally start at u and b and keep going up until you get to the lowest common ancestor. And that would give you a query time of, of course, o log n. It's going to be a bit worse, but not much. So you don't even need to code this if, uh, if you're solving, for example, the homework. Okay, great. So this has a lot of other applications as well. I will put on some lectures on Canvas. There are many other problems that you can solve. Generally speaking, if you have a problem on a tree and it seems like having uh, a small height would really help you, it's always worth it to consider, can I take a centroid decomposition of my tree and then try to solve my problem using the centroid decomposition? Okay, I'm going to show you another type of decomposition as well. This is called the heavy path decomposition. And sometimes it's also called heavy light decomposition. Okay. So let me just give you a simple problem to motivate this. So my problem is this. Let's say in the input, again, just as usual, I have given you a tree with n vertices. And this time, let's say that I have a value written on each one of the vertices. So each one of my vertices now has a value. So I have a function, let's call it val for value, that maps my vertices to real numbers. Okay. Now I want to support two types of operations. I want to be able to change some values. That's my first type of operation. So I would just do something like this. I would say change vx. And this means change the value of vertex V to X. And let's say I also have a query. It does something like this. It says query V. And in response to this query, you have to output the maximum value among vertex V and all of its ancestors. So if I start at V and keep going up until I get to the root, what is the biggest value that I'm going to see at my nodes, at all of the ancestors of V? So this one should return the maximum over all U's that are ancestors of V of the value of U. Now, again, what would happen if I just do the naive algorithm? I can say, well, I just keep track of the values in an array. Every time that I have to change, I change the value in all one. I'm just changing one entry in my value array. And every time that I do query, I'm going to start at vertex V and just keep going to its parents and go until you get to the root. Every time you go to the parent and also keep track of this maximum value. Just remember what was the maximum value that you saw in this path. But again, our problem is very similar to the previous case. The problem is that the height of this tree might be too much. Maybe I just have a path. Maybe the height of my tree is omega n. 
And then I would actually, the best guarantee that I can give is that my query is O n. So I can do my changes in O one, but my queries in O n. And of course, I don't like this because I'm always imagining that I'm also doing n operations. So this would be O n squared overall. Okay, so n operations. Can we do better than this? Well, this should kind of remind you of the things that we were doing when we were doing queries on segments or in intervals, right? We had, for example, uh, this array, and we had a number at every position of the array, and we were answering queries like, what is the sum of all the numbers in this interval, or what is the maximum, what is the x or so on? Right. And we did that using segment trees, using femvic trees. There was also this square root decomposition idea. Right. So this looks very similar. But actually, the problem is that this is a tree. If instead of a tree, I just had a path, this would be the same problem that we were solving using femvic and segment tree and so on. Right. So in some sense, we know how to solve both extremes. I know what to do if the height of my tree is small. If the height of my tree is small, then where I want to do query, I just start at B, keep walking forward, walking up until I get to the root, right? I know what to do in the extreme case where the height of the tree is literally N and I have just a path. I can just create a segment tree on top of the path, or I can create a Fenwick tree on top of the path. But I don't know what to do with things like this. They're not balanced, and they're also not paths. So what can I do? Well, here's where the idea of heavy path decomposition comes. So let's say that I, again, compute these uh, subtree sizes. So let me just take all of these. So this is my tree. And the numbers in green are the subtree sizes. OK. Now, I'm going to say that some of my edges are heavy. And this is actually a word that I also used when I was talking about finding a centroid. So for every vertex, I say that the child that has the largest subtree is the heavy child. And all the other children are light children. OK, so that's the definition. So uh, V is the heavy child of U. If, of course, first of all, V is a child of U. And secondly, the subtree of V is larger than or equal to the subtree of any other child of U for any V prime that is a child of U. I'm going to write it like that. Okay. And I say an edge is a heavy edge if it's uh, connecting a parent to one of its heavy children. Okay. So let me just show my heavy edges in red here. This is a heavy edge, right? So, okay, I'll do it like this. Uh, at vertex two, both of them have the same uh, size. So I'm just going to choose one of them arbitrarily in this case as the heavy edge, but I'm not going to choose both, okay? So you can have a rule to break the ties. You can say that if there is more than one child that has the maximum Subtree size, I take the one that comes lexicographically first, or whatever rule you want, as long as you make sure that you pick only one of them. Okay, so every node, every vertex is going to have exactly one heavy child, with the exception of uh, leaves that don't have children at all. Okay, so I say that the heavy child of two is five. Uh, three doesn't have any children, the heavy child of four is eight, right? Because five is bigger than two. The heavy child of five is nine. The heavy child of six is 10. The heavy child of seven is 11. The heavy child of eight is 12. 
these are leaves they don't have heavy children and the heavy child of 12 again i should just have a rule that breaks the tie here and picks one of them as the heavy child so let's say i picked 15 as the heavy child But again, I have a tie-breaking rule, so I always talk about the heavy child. Every node has exactly one heavy child, unless uh, it's a leaf, in which case it doesn't have children. Okay. So this is actually this collection of uh, heavy edges is what I call a heavy path decomposition. Because you can see that the heavy edges actually create a bunch of paths inside the tree. So just look at the paths in red. I have this path here, I have this path here, and I have these two paths, which are each just one edge. Okay. So these are called heavy paths, and then all of the heavy paths together are the heavy path decomposition. Okay. And all of the other edges are called light edges. And of course, all of the other children are called light children. Now, why is this useful? Well, first of all, I like to have paths because on paths, I can do all sorts of things. If my query was inside one of these heavy paths, I could easily answer it, right? So for example, if my query was about uh, vertex 15, I could just create a segment tree on each one of my heavy paths, and I could answer the queries that are entirely within this path, because paths are easy to work with. Again, it's up to you how you want to answer those. You can also create a fenvic tree on each uh, heavy path. But let's say that for each heavy path, I have a segment tree, so I can answer queries about segments of this path, OK? So now if someone does query 15, basically it's asking me what is the maximum value if I start at 15 and go up all the way to one. But all of this is in the red path and I have a segment tree on the red path so I can just query that segment tree. Okay. But what if I ask for something else? Suppose that for example, I ask for 13. I ask, what is the, uh, let's say I query 13. So what is the maximum value that we we'll see if you start at 13 and go all the way to the root? Now here, I can say, well, I start at 13. And first, I take a light edge that goes to 12. And for light edges, I don't have any extra data structures. I'm just going to walk over the edge. But as soon as I get to 12, now I have a heavy path, and I can just jump to the beginning of that heavy path, which is fine. OK. Similarly, if I query 10, I'm going to query 10. First, I see a heavy path, so I jump to the top of the heavy path. Uh, so let's say I have a segment tree or something on this heavy path. And then I see a light edge from 6 to 2. I take that one light edge. And then I see a light edge from two to one. I take that one light edge. And of course, depending on what my query wants to answer, I have to keep track of some value. This can be maximum, sum, whatever. In this case, it's not. OK. So what would my total runtime be? So you understand the data structure now, right? So I'm taking the heavy path decomposition. And then on top of each one of my heavy paths, I'm creating a segment tree. OK, and whenever there is a query from a vertex, I'm just going to start. And I say, whenever I reach a heavy path, I use my segment tree to query it. And whenever I'm at the end of a heavy path and I have to take a light edge, I just take the light edge. And these are taken one by one. OK. So the question is, what would my runtime be? My claim is that if I start at any vertex and I keep going up to the root, the number of light edges that I'm going to see is at most log n. OK, so the path from v from any vertex v
to the root has all log n light edges. Why is this the case? Well, because every time that I'm taking a light edge, it means that I went from some child to its parent, but this wasn't the heavy child of the parent. So the parent had a child with a bigger subtree. So every time that I'm traversing a light edge, the size of my subtree is at least doubling. And it can double at most log n times before it covers everything. So the path from any vertex v to the root has all log n light edges. What does this tell you about this path? It tells you that I'm starting from this vertex v. Maybe I'm taking a light edge. And then I'm taking some portion of a heavy path. And then I'm taking another light edge. Then I'm taking another portion of a heavy path. And then taking another light edge, another portion of a heavy path, and so on, until I reach the root. But the number of light edges that I'm taking is log n. So the number of heavy paths in between is also log n at most, right? Because I'm just going from blue to red to blue to red and so on. If I have log n blues, I have log n plus one reds at most. It's all log n. Okay. Now, but what is my query time? I'm starting at the vertex B, and for each of the light edges, I'm traversing it one edge at a time. So that's log n time for the light edges. But when it comes to the heavy parts, I traverse this whole path by just one query to my segment tree. But a query to a segment tree takes log n time. So I'm spending log n time for each one of these uh, red portions, but I have at most log n of them. So my total query time is actually O log squared n. Okay. By the way, uh, one thing I saw in the midterm exam was that there was one person who confused log log n and log squared n. These two are not the same thing. So this is log squared n means log of n times log of n. Log log n means that you first take the log of n and then you take the log of that. Okay. So this is better than log n. This is much worse than log n. Okay. So my query time is all log squared n. But what is my pre-processing time? This is the last point I want to cover today. So on each one of these red paths, I'm setting up some sort of a data structure. I'm setting up a segment tree or maybe a fanvig tree. Setting up a segment tree, if I had the path of length k, that would take OK, right? Go back to the lecture on segment tree. So my runtime here is going to be the sum of the lengths of these red paths. But that's also at most O n, because every edge is appearing at most once. So I'm doing O n pre-processing. And then every time that I'm doing a query, I'm answering it in O log squared n. What about these updates? What about the case when I'm changing a value? So when I'm changing a value, again, you just have to do case work. Is, is this a light child of its parent? Is it a heavy child of its parent? Am I currently inside a heavy path or am I not inside the heavy path? That's basically what you have to figure out. If you are inside the heavy path, you have to do your update on the segment tree. If you are outside of the heavy path, you just keep track of the value of the current node at the node itself. Okay, so my updates are actually going to just take O log n time. 